Orlando, June 2016. 49 people gunned down, the largest mass shooting in U.S. history. During his spree, the killer called 911 and pledged allegiance to the Islamic State. Acts like these are fueling a growing battle between ISIS and the West. Attacks. When we saw what's happened in Paris, if we didn't defend them here, they will be all over the world. Now, Americans and other Westerners are taking the fight to ISIS. America. Most Westerners, they just want to fight. They just want to kill Daesh. I traveled to northern Syria to meet these vigilantes, men and women whose goal is to bring down ISIS. It's a uh, hard feeling to describe. I can't say I necessarily felt bad about it or sorry for, you know, killing a uh, ISIS fighter, but it's still a human being. There's nothing good about war, to be honest. There's only good in why you fight wars, and that's really just why I'm here. Daniel Carolyn, a former U.S. Marine, is one of several hundred unpaid volunteers who have traveled to Syria to fight the Islamic State. Yeah, I've definitely uh, done uh, what I come out, came out here to do. I've definitely felt like I've uh, been a part of helping putting ISIS to an end. Is that why you came to Syria, to put a stop to them here? Yeah. If you're going to put a stop to them, you got to stop them in uh, where they're coming from first, where their uh, extremism mindset is is set up and that is that is here American and European volunteers like Daniel have been traveling to Syria since 2014 when the Islamic State launched a lightning offensive that surprised the world and captured huge areas of Syria and Iraq including the key cities of Mosul and Raqqa the Islamic State's capital and then came the attacks on the West Paris January 2015 12 people murdered in attacks on the offices of Charlie Hebdo. Less than a year later, ISIS militants strike Paris again, killing 130. In March 2016, bomb blasts in Belgium take the lives of at least 30 more. And then the attacks in Orlando and San Bernardino, with shooters claiming to be motivated by ISIS. All told, the Islamic State's attacks have left more than a thousand dead outside the war zones in Syria and Iraq. All this motivating Americans and other Westerners to fight ISIS, or Daesh, as the group is commonly referred to in Arabic. Most Westerners, they just want to fight. They just want to kill Daesh. Daesh is the great enemy to the world, a great enemy to freedom, a great enemy to autonomy in religion and autonomy in, in liberty. You know, I mean, we had like the When I met Detroit native John Cole, He'd been in Syria for three months. Before coming to Syria, he worked on a cattle ranch in Australia and in the Ecuadorian Amazon. I was never worried about going to prison or being interrogated. I wasn't worried about being killed. But my main worry has been uh, unable to participate, from being unable to help. You know, at the end of the day, this is humanitarian cause, as ironic as that might sound. Joining the fight means embedding with the Kurdish militia known as the People's Protection Units, or YPG. They control three regions in northern Syria that border Turkey and Iraq. The Kurds and the American volunteers share a common enemy, the Islamic State. The front line in the war against the jihadists is to the south of the Kurdish-held areas, known collectively as Rojava. The problem in Rojava with ISIS is not only in Rojava, actually. We saw what's happened in Beirut, in Paris. If we didn't defend them here, they will be all over the world, killing and suiciding and bombing everywhere. Uh, 
Denise Sepan is a Syrian Kurd who studied architecture until the civil war broke out. She fled Damascus and soon joined a Kurdish militia. She now trains foreign volunteers. Her job, teach them a few words in Kurdish and how to handle an AK-47. Our job is take care of the people who come here, give them a right train so they could use in front line. Most of them have different story about coming here. Uh, some of them have been revolution people who go wherever there is a revolution and they help. Some of them uh, were ex-soldiers. They won't have the glory back again. Or uh, people who, like me, uh, didn't know what to do with their life and were looking for a bigger meaning. Well, the number is uh, increasing actually. I think almost uh, 800 to 900, almost. The Kurds are known as the largest ethnic group without a country. And for as long as most Kurds can remember, they've been ruled by outsiders in their own homeland. For many of the 30 million Kurds living in Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, the Islamic State is just the latest face of foreign oppression. I'm fighting because I'm Kurdish, I have to defend my country. But those people who came from, I don't know where, I mean, that means they care about you. So you don't feel you're alone and you feel supported. Some of the Western volunteers in the YPG are glory seekers, felons on the run, or even out of work Hollywood actors. But most are essentially vigilantes. They're volunteers looking for their personal brand of justice. <laughs> um, there's the lab. Zirik is an army combat medic from Norway. He asked me to use only his Kurdish name, which means clever, because he fears backlash from ISIS sympathizers. The Islamic State has reportedly put a hit on foreign volunteers in the YPG to the tune of $150,000. There's not many patients at the moment. Most of the beds are empty. It's a good sign, at least. When I met Zirik, he was working at one of the few hospitals still receiving patients. This is basically the hospital's pharmacy. Uh, this comes mainly from field hospitals and hospitals captured from Daesh. A little bit of it, just a little bit, comes from humanitarian aid that we get. I find it amazing that Daesh would have so much medicine. Well, Daesh has so, so much because Syria was well uh, equipped from the start. Like all the hospitals, there were a lot of clinics on the outskirts of villages. A lot of this medicine is made in Syria. So they got a lot of their equipment from early on. The Islamic State has more medicine, money and weapons than the YPG. But the Kurdish militias are the United States' most effective ally in the war against ISIS. I wanted to know how the American volunteers fit into this war. Take your shoes off. This is the uh, house we're staying in right now. It's actually uh, pretty nice. Daniel Carolyn lives in this safe house a few miles from the front lines. He's the only foreign volunteer in this Kurdish assault unit. We sleep in this room. It's kind of lay out blankets and we got the mats. We just crash out, sleep together like a, like a big sleepover. <laughs> this is the, uh, the room we keep all our uh, weapons, equipment get our equipment ready for the next operation. There's a phrase that I always uh, think of out here. It's um, complacency kills. And I try my best not to be complacent because, you know, a lot of the times that's how you'll get killed. Do you see that trenches over there? Oh, 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 that white uh, trenches uh, belongs to ISIS. Yeah.
November 2015. I'm in northern Syria, and the war against the Islamic State is in full swing. I'm heading to the front lines to get a first-hand look at the combat and to meet some of the hundreds of Western vigilantes fighting against ISIS. The People's Protection Units, or YPG, have launched an offensive in northern Syria to recapture towns along the Iraqi border. Their goal? Cut off supply lines between the Caliphate's two main strongholds, Raqqa and Mosul. The key is seizing the town of Al Hol. On the outskirts of the village, I met Commander Zinn. Do you see that trenches over there? That white trenches are uh, belongs to ISIS. Uh. Zin is a commander with an all-female Kurdish militia fighting alongside the men in the YPG. The day I met Zin, the men and women under her command had been engaging ISIS with mortars and machine guns since early morning. An estimated 40,000 fighters make up the ranks of Syria's Kurdish militias. About 40% are women. <laughs> when they go to fight, they fight mixed men, women. The person in the trench next to you could be a guy or a girl. I've seen, I met girls who, after dark, would sneak behind enemy lines and plant mines. You know, that was their job, fighting, fighting and dying, just like the men. This is Hannah Bowman's second time in Syria. She's Canadian, and one of the core reasons she joined was women here are allowed to fight, even lead major operations. I knew that before I even came the first time. I knew enough about the YPJ to realize that it was an army unseen in history before, uh, a women's army fighting for women's rights, especially in the Middle East. They were the complete opposite of ISIS. Many of the girls and women in the militias have pledged their lives to the cause. They can't have relationships or families. Their lives essentially belong to the Kurdish militia. Um, their only option uh, traditionally has been marriage. Uh, they're, you know, they weren't allowed to get jobs and stuff like that. So they get forced into marriage and if they don't get married by a certain age, it brings shame to the family. Like, why, are, why aren't you married? What's wrong with you? So then the YPJ came along and it provides them another option. On our way back from the front lines, we visited the town of Al Hol. About a day before, it had been taken back from ISIS. Signs of fresh airstrikes were everywhere. All of the town's residents had fled amid the fighting. The Sharia court from where the Islamic State governed the city was empty. Court records and propaganda were all they left behind. Here, I could see how the war in Syria is often about little things, capturing a crossing, the high ground, one village after another, often with disastrous consequences. In the summer of 2014, ISIS militants stormed through here on their way to the Iraqi city of Sinjar. There, Islamic State fighters slaughtered hundreds of Yazidis and displaced hundreds of thousands more. The Yazidis are a religious community with roots dating back thousands of years. But the Islamic State declared the Yazidis infidels and sanctioned their indiscriminate killing. Yazidi women were sold as slaves to foreign militants. We found dark evidence of what life was like for some of them under the Islamic State. <laughs> It's atrocities like these that have driven some Westerners to fight ISIS in Syria. This is what used to be a jail. 
It's no more than seven feet by seven feet. You can see some water bottles, a book, uh, and what looks like a drawing by a child. And you can also see writing on the wall that says, we've been here since March. And you see a calendar and the days are ticked off until you get to about May and then there's no more writing. In many ways, this conflict in Syria is about young people. Denise is just 21 and already runs the foreign volunteer training program. One of the all-female militias we met on the front line was Denise's unit. <laughs> if she weren't training foreigners, she'd be fighting with them. Though morale was high from the successful battles of al Hol, their hearts were heavy. They had just lost their commander in a firefight. She was my commander. I can't believe it until now. I'm not ready to accept it. Losing a friend here is not that easy. I mean, I know we're soldiers, we're fighting, this, th this things happens, but she was only 20 years old. Uh, I'm sorry. It's okay. As I'd soon learn in the battle against ISIS, dying young is more common than I imagined. <laughs> There were several bombs. Several bombs, yeah. Yeah, you can see that. At least it's in English. I mean, it, I don't know who, what country it came from, but you can see that this part right here now says, warning, two-man lift. American fighters are leaving their mark across Syria, but most of them never set foot here. They're off in command centers, hundreds or thousands of miles away or high in the sky. They're part of an international coalition that has dropped more than 25,000 bombs on ISIS targets in Iraq and Syria. It's the most successful phase of the war against ISIS thus far. What's surprising is who is calling in the airstrikes. 22-year-old Zanar Derek is one of a handful of YPG soldiers who have traded in old AK-47s for tablets and a satellite internet connection. His job is to provide a steady stream of ISIS targets to bomb. That's why I'm going to Using the information from frontline fighters, Zanar maps out the location of ISIS militants. He then sends the GPS coordinates of those positions to an undisclosed command center. Coalition forces use that information to launch attacks, sometimes in a matter of minutes. <laughs> Before the U.S. airstrikes began, the Kurds were losing ground to ISIS. Today, the Islamic State has lost 45% of its territory in Syria, and most of it has been taken back by the Kurds. The Islamic State has countered by sending waves of suicide bombers, driving trucks 
filled with thousands of pounds of explosives. Oh, 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 they'll come with one of these as uh, an interlude to an attack. So they'll come and they'll try to soften up the position uh, by detonating one of these, and then an attack will follow. Obviously, Dash lacks the airstrike capacity that uh, Yepaga has, so this is sort of their way of uh, making up for it. This truck bomb, straight out of Mad Max, is one of the rare car bombs the YPG has been able to stop without destroying it. There really isn't a protocol on what to do next. As we approach the truck, I learned it was still fully loaded with explosives. I think on this one, we got probably about 16 barrels. And there's about 100 to 150 kilograms of explosive material inside. This would be one that would be big enough to probably destroy a pretty large sized building. Generally, the way to react is trying to pick them off before they get there, which means just shooting everything you have at it. Not far from John's base, I heard of a Christian village that had been attacked by Islamic State fighters. More than 130 people had been kidnapped, including women and children, and held for ransom. The commander of the local Christian militia took us to see the town's church and to meet the six people who had stayed behind. <laughs> it was scenes like this that brought Daniel Kitchens to Syria. Islamic State, Daesh, coming out here, beheading people, killing Christians, killing anyone, uh, innocent people. You know, it really hit home with me, being a Christian and all that. And, uh, and you know, I got tired of sitting around and talking about how these, these guys just need to pay. And Daniel is in the same attacking unit as John, along with several other volunteers from Europe. He's from small town Georgia, and this is his first time outside of the United States. Yeah, my family, uh, they all thought I was very crazy. Yeah, and uh, my mom's worried to death about me. John and Daniel's unit is known as the cowboy unit. They often circle their Humvees, stolen from ISIS, around an enemy position, guns blazing. Their commander, Soran Hauleri, is an Iraqi Kurd who for a while lived in England. He says he loves fighting with Americans because they want to kill ISIS militants as much as he does. Some Western volunteers told us fighters under Soran's command were responsible for some of the abuses detailed in a critical Amnesty International investigation. The report claims Kurdish forces demolished the homes of Arab residents in towns taken from the Islamic State. Saran's aggressive and controversial tactics helped the Kurds and the American volunteers push deeper into Islamic State strongholds. Uh, really? Uh, interesting. 
What did you say? So basically, two weeks ago, Dash came down from the mountains and attacked the villages here. And then they repelled the attack, and Dash has gone back to the other side of the mountain. So they're preparing just in case they attack again. So where is the front line now? That mountain is the front line. Dash is on the other side. And Dash could theoretically come over that mountain right now. Theoretically. Yeah. Right now, we're on the other side of the mountain from basically the demarcation between Dash and Yepaga territory. Uh, we're going to go up there to the forward position, and we should be able to see on the other side of the mountain. We're on the peak of the Abdulaziz mountain, and this is the most forward position before going into ISIS-held territory. Down there in the flatlands, there's about 300 to 400 ISIS fighters, and they often come up the mountain to attack these positions because they're so strategic. For example, today at 5 in the morning, they attacked this radio tower over here, but they were pushed back by the YPG, and they repelled the attack. Only 80 miles across the desert is the city of Raqqa, the nerve center of the caliphate. There, Kurdish forces and the coalition's jets have their sights set on dealing the Islamic State a decisive blow. The Islamic State may be losing territory, but underestimating its fighters can be a deadly mistake, a lesson the Kurds are keen to avoid again. In late 2014, at the height of its power, the Islamic State was on the brink of dealing a crushing defeat to serious Kurdish militias. For weeks, ISIS laid siege to the northern Kurdish town of Kobani. A few hundred Kurdish soldiers were all that remained in the city. Cornered near the border with Turkey, they faced thousands of ISIS militants surrounding the city. With the collapse of the city imminent, the United States called in airstrikes. The bombings helped end the siege and left Kobani in ruins. It's been more than a year since the fighting stopped here in Kobani, but everywhere you go, you can still find signs of how fierce and intense that fighting was. It's definitely been one of the hardest hit places in all of Syria. Decaying bodies could still be found in the rubble. Two uniforms here. They look like they appear to be Daesh or ISIS fighters. Oh, that smells horrible. Aunat nal vedare, aunat bi khadel bar piyachi. Ki khadel khalas kena, ki Islamate khalas kena. Islamate yuna juwaran, milat bi kujan, jani ma khal, lo khwa na kahken, bol mulki ma ei wambe. Could be Allah Akbar, but Allah Akbar, eh, I was on it. Could not be Allah Akbar, I'm the person. Swar and Fayyad are neighbors in downtown Kobani. Swar's bombed out home is just about the only building standing in the neighborhood. Fayyad's home was taken by ISIS and destroyed during the siege. <laughs> The people of Kobani are part of the estimated 2 million Syrian refugees who have tried to make a new life in Europe or have died trying. Alan Kurdi, the three-year-old boy who drowned off the coast of Greece, sparking international outrage, was from Kobani. Despite the deaths of thousands of migrants, 
most of Suar's family and friends decided the journey was worth the risk. Because of the dead Kurdish soldiers buried here, the collapse of the city, and the vanishing dreams of its residents, Kobani is known as the martyred city. Since the fighting stopped, the hospital where Zurich works has brought in more staff and equipment and now treats patients from front lines further away. But everyone we spoke to said the conditions were basic and insufficient. And for Zurich, the biggest need is stabilizing patients on the front line. Here is this is some of the ambulances. And you can see there's major damage. On this side, you have bullet holes as well. These were ambulances used during the Battle of Kobani that were bringing the wounded from the fight, and they got shot. From the amount of damage, it's either bombs or RPGs. But you see there's, they're full of bullet holes as well. And they, were they being targeted? Of course, because that knows that that's where the medical personnel is. So, and if you kill a doctor, they won't be able to save someone's life and they won't come back to kill you. It's an investment to the future, you know. They won't come back. They got ro royally f***ed up. But these guys, they already knew they were being targeted when they're trying to help someone. They still did it. Everyone that comes in a battle knows what the dangers are that you can ultimately pay with your life. But the people here thought it was worth it because Kobani was a huge symbol for them. It broke Daesh's world to fight in the north. It showed also the world that the Kurds could do this, that they were willing to fight with everything they had for their freedom. The battle for Kobani is now a rallying cry for Kurds and Westerners like Zurich. Except today, the tide has turned and those fighting ISIS see an opportunity for payback. Now the capital of the self-proclaimed caliphate is on the horizon. Downtime for a unit accustomed to fighting is rare in this fast-paced war. Just enough time to let the wounded heal and to practice upcoming missions. We went with Daniel on one of those drills to see what a YPG assault looks like. in the rest of the village. Saw a lot of live fire going on. So. Is this how it usually looks? In the training, yeah. It gets a little bit crazy sometimes, especially when everybody's firing. Live ammunition in a training event all over the place. So I work with them as best as I can. Sometimes it's difficult. People are set in their ways. See, a lot of the times, some things happen that guys don't like, they think shouldn't happen in a Western-type military situation, such as friendly fire or bullets from, you know, friendlies coming over your head, little things. Here we're practicing the controlled retreating from the village. People keep control of it. And it looks like it. Yeah, a little bit of a workout. <laughs> Pretty hot here still for the winter. 
Commander Rezgor Serekani leads one of the divisions that sees the most fighting, the mobilized attacking units. It also has one of the largest shares of Western fighters. A lot of Americans, foreigners, have told us that they clash with some of their Kurdish uh, colleagues or comrades because of different uh, military styles and tactics. Why do you think those that friction exists sometimes? Naha çavat insana ki insana her coğrafya dünyada var ne gel havdu henek nefam kirin der kevese şerji bu saye her her kes her hez her artış gorku cüre tarzı bu şey vazivan eşer hene ne be perskirik yani zengin buyun derdik yine. And what development do you need to be in this? For example, as to take the vision, ye jee ki hatiye to take the vision. Am to take ki half part what they need to have do. Yani fikre ki kolektif tarz ki daha kolektif der dikinet. The Kurds are known as tough and scrappy fighters. They're used to being the underdogs in the fight. The Americans and Westerners are mostly inexperienced on the battlefield, and several have been killed by ISIS. I was in the same village the day he was killed. If it wasn't him, half of our friends out there will be dead now. Well, I'm gonna zero the gun. Uh, zeroing the gun means when you shoot at something, you make sure that you got it. Bottom left, you're in the circle, though. Having fought various enemies for different reasons throughout the years, Syrian Kurds are battle-tested like few armies. And the truth is, the Western vigilantes helping them aren't needed, at least not as soldiers. From a soldiering point of view, the ones who are here aren't going to make a, a huge difference, right? Like, I'm not going to make a huge difference to the body count, you know, the dead dash. Uh, where we will make a difference is when we go back, and we talk about it to, you know, the friends or media and stuff like that. That's where we can really be the most beneficial to the Kurds. Why? Uh, because we're a voice. We're a, we're a Western voice. We're not just Kurds, you know, saying, hey, this is happening to us, this is happening to us. Yeah, you've been saying that for decades. Now the Westerners are saying this is happening to them. In essence, the Kurds allow Westerners the opportunity to fight ISIS. And in return, the Kurds receive an army of international spokespeople. I got it. But that game entails huge risks. You want to try? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Most recruits ultimately learn how to fight on the front lines with live rounds and a ruthless enemy, where inexperience or carelessness can end up in a real casualty. Oh my God, what have you done? I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. okay. I think your eye needs a doctor, maybe. No, oh, it'll be fine. At least now I have a battle scroll. At least 10 foreign volunteers, including one American, have been killed in Syria fighting ISIS. This is Haval Baguk. He was the first Australian who was killed here. I was in the same village the day he was killed. If it wasn't him, half of our friends out there would be dead now. I think it's, it's the communication between, you know, they don't speak Kurdish is very big problem and most of the people doesn't understand that until they got to front line someone screaming at you get down and you don't understand it because they speak Kurdish it is very painful for this kind of things to happen you know two three months ago this was completely abandoned like nobody was here but they, they all started to trickle back in. They're all here, it's filled up. You get, they're going to uh, their, their mosque, their Christian church, their, and hopefully uh, there'll be more people that come back. And you two feel safe walking around here? I know you have AKs on your shoulder, but you feel I safe? Feel, yeah. I feel safe walking in the town even without this. Absolutely, I feel completely safe. I think that here, even until Tamar, there are certainly some people who are in support of Daesh, but uh, it's, it's definitely safe. The, the vast, vast majority of people are 
pro-democracy, they're pro-Yepige. Two weeks after filming this interview, ISIS set off multiple car bombs, killing at least 50 people. As ISIS retreats, attacks like these have become all too frequent. I think that was an IED? Probably. You don't seem rattled at all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it happens a lot, unfortunately. It doesn't really rattle me that much anymore. Sometimes Syria looks so peaceful with these sunsets. Then out of the blue, you hear gunfire or you know an explosion in the distance. And then you understand that you're in a war zone and it's nerve wracking. But for a lot of these guys, it's just daily life. As the Kurds have solidified their control over northeastern Syria, their political wing has declared the area a federal autonomous region. Well, life is too short to so love the one you got. One thing is for certain, they still have a lot of fighting to do. John and Daniel's commander, Saran, took us to see some of the most recent battle sites on the road to Raqqa. Attacking ISIS in Raqqa and even defeating them there probably won't mean an end to the Islamic State. Since I've left, John, Daniel, Zirik, and Hannah have been joined by more Americans. They're not volunteers, they're U.S. Special Forces. But just as the Western fighters are trying to bring the fight to ISIS, the Islamic State is increasingly trying to bring the war to the United States.